Joining me now is the best-selling author of The War on the West and associate editor of The Spectator, Douglas Murray. Douglas, let's start with socialism. Um, we have a segment on this program called Lefties Losing It and we play clips from around the world of, of socialists and other lefties having meltdowns and I thought you might appreciate this. Just having my regular meltdown and realizing I'm never going to escape capitalism and I'm just going to be a cog in the machine of productivity for my whole life. So, happy just. Now, we've been reading for years about how millennials and Gen Z have turned their back on capitalism. Here's a piece from The Guardian saying nearly eight out of ten young Britons blame capitalism for the housing crisis and two-thirds want to live under a socialist economic system. It's from a couple of years mm. ago. What do you make of this? What would be your advice to that distressed young woman crying about capitalism? Uh, I'd say several things. The first thing is a very basic thing, which is learn some history. Just learn some history, specifically learn the history of countries that did not have free markets. Uh, learn the history of Russia, for instance, in the 20th century, or of any Eastern European country in the 20th century, and uh, uh, see what it's actually like. Try to try to understand beyond yourself what it's actually like to be simply a cog in a machine, because that is what communism and what socialism is. It is something that prioritizes not the individual, but the system. So the individual is of no significance other than the extent to which they can assist the system. That is actually where you are a cog in the machine. There are all sorts of problems in our modern economies, all sorts of issues of young people getting onto the housing market, into the housing life, Ladder, uh, of um, the problems, inflation, many, many issues we face. But first of all, learn some historical context. Learn that in the past, before we had free markets, things were so infinitely worse that, for instance, the young woman in question wouldn't have even had a phone in her hand uh, uh, to record this rant on. I think there's a mad context collapse. <laughs> of this here. But the second thing, very quickly, is just to say, you know, the only system that human beings have come up with in which we are capable en masse of self-improvement and of achieving self-worth is in free market societies. We have not come up with another system. And to think that because something in the capital, capitalist system at the moment doesn't serve you well, uh, you should abandon that system is like a fish saying it doesn't much like this stretch of water and it would like to leave water as a whole. <laughs> Wonderful analogy. And if failing all that, we can uh, crowdfund a one-way ticket to Venezuela, perhaps. Uh, they're trying socialism right now. Yeah. Not working particularly well. Um, now, Douglas, you were personally named in the British government's review of its national counter-terrorism program. Apparently, a prevent education officer compared recruitment material from Islamist jihadists to material that you produce. I mean, this is just crazy stuff. And it wasn't just you. Uh, Heart of Darkness author Joseph Conrad, Narnia C.S. Lewis. What in mm -hmm. God's name is happening in the UK? Yes, the, it's a quite amazing story. The, um, the British government set up the so-called Prevent program after the suicide bombings in 2005 on the London Underground. And uh, the aim of the Prevent program was meant to stop radicalization uh, among uh, young British uh, Muslims. But of course, as, as you know, Rita, uh, as many viewers will know, there's no government funded project that can't find a way to enlarge in time. And the Prevent program decided that its job was not just to deal with Islamic extremism, but all forms of extremism. This included, because this program was, uh, was um, uh, advised by radical far-left groups, this included a, a, an attempt to claim that, that, that there was a, a problem with far-right terrorism. Now, in fact, there is a problem with far-right terrorism everywhere. It's always a problem. You can get far-left terrorism, far-right terrorism, Islamist terrorism, all sorts of terrorism. But it decided that far-right terrorism didn't have enough attention. And in the process, 
uh, decided to hand out material that, first of all, alleged that um, being in favour of Brexit was effectively far right, that the uh, cabinet minister <laughs> Jacob Reed Mogg was far right, and that there was actually a list of books that were said to be warning signs. Uh, one of them was my own, uh, if I say so myself, international bestseller, The Strange Death of Europe on immigration. And when I saw that this was on a list of suspect books issued by a government program in the UK, I felt, as you can imagine, a kind of white hot anger. And it only diminished a little when I discovered that other suspect books included the works of C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, uh, Joseph Conrad, as you mentioned, and also, by the way, owning a copy of 1984 by George Orwell. I promise you, Rita, it sounds what? like it was made up, but you couldn't make this up. That is astonishing, and you are in very good company. I think uh, you should be very much uh, proud of yourself to be in that company. Oh, I, that is extraordinary. But we've got the same issue here with these de-radicalisation programs and how effective they actually are. I think there's been very little scrutiny on the outcomes and effectiveness of such programs. Now... We're a week away from the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You've written in the New York Post about the war moving to the next level. How is this conflict going to end? Do we need to build Vladimir Putin a golden bridge to retreat across, to quote the, uh, the art of war? Uh, that, that's effectively my view. I, I mean, there are different uh, scenarios I outlined in that piece, uh, partly on the basis of my travelling and reporting from Ukraine last year. Uh, I think that there are different scenarios. Some people say, why not give Ukrainians all the things they need now? And I think the answer to that is that NATO has decided that a gradually, gradually approach is better in order not to uh, effectively uh, cause a, a, a bigger conflagration with, with Russia, of course, something that nobody wants. Um, a, a Ukrainian victory that took some time seems to be a desirable outcome. I mean, of course, you know, all the time you've got to remember lives on both sides are being lost at an astonishing rate, but this was a war that Vladimir Putin started totally unnecessarily on totally false pretexts. Uh, I think, however, that there is a strategic uh, question here, which Henry Kissinger and others have also raised, which is effectively, as you say, Rita, you know, what is the off ramp for Putin? Um, I believe that it's, it's desirable that Russia loses this war, that Putin loses this war, but uh, he has he has a very tricky uh, challenge with his own people as to how he presents it. He could, of course, himself, and this is something I mentioned, he could stop the war tomorrow. Um, he could withdraw his forces uh, from Ukrainian territory, claim that his denazification program of uh, the Ukraine uh, has been successful, and um, and say a load of other stuff that will persuade some of his loyalists in Russia. He could do that. Um, uh, so I think it is very important people realise that you know the continuation of the war is not because of NATO, which I'm afraid some people on the right as well as left now say. It's not because of NATO, and nor is it because of the Ukrainians fighting for their country. The person primarily responsible for, um, for this war, the, the one man responsible for this war is Vladimir Putin, and he is the one man who on his own could end it. But I'm afraid that, you know, as he has demonstrated throughout this conflict, he has absolutely no care for the life of Ukrainians. And he has absolutely no care for the life of young Russians who he's conscripting and sending into this, this appalling mill of conflict, which is, as I say, the most avoidable conflict imaginable. And one which is now, sadly, entering its second year. Now, finally, my favourite cartoon, the brilliantly clever South Park, has taken aim at Meghan and Harry. Let's have a look. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's the worldwide privacy tour. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come It's the worldwide privacy tour. We want privacy. 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 We want privac
<laughs> oh, I love it. They don't uh, specifically call them Harry and Meghan, but it's unmistakable. And the worldwide privacy tour even comes to Australia. Um, how do you think the uh, the miserable Joe is going to respond to that? Oh, I think it's wonderful. Uh, South Park has shown it still hasn't <laughs> lost touch even after all of these decades. Um, you know, the, um, ridicule uh, is such a wonderful tool, and uh, South Park has used it always uh, better than anyone. It, it, they do, of course, point to this just central fallacy, and you and I have discussed this, Rita, even before South Park got onto it, that there is something utterly uh, um, insane about constantly complaining about your privacy being invaded whilst invading your privacy more than anyone else. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm thrilled that South Park has, has once again knocked it out of the park. Oh, absolutely. It's one program that has not jumped the shark despite being on for God knows how many years, 20 years. It's incredible. Douglas Murray, thank you so much for joining me. It's a great pleasure as always. Thank you.